Okay, I'm on. Good. Well, I'm already very excited to be here because we have exceeded three. That was my goal of, you know, my attendance in here. Um, I apologize that the title was a little off. Um, this, this session is actually creative funding for fitness professionals. I didn't want you to think I was a bank or some mortgage broker or something like that. Totally not that. Um, so I don't have over 20 years. I just realized this year will be 20 years. And I told him, I said, I don't quite feel old enough to have done anything for 20 years, but I guess the reality is hitting me. Um, I have been in this industry for a long time and I have owned fitness businesses, corporate wellness programs, training studios, I had car dealerships, all sorts of things. And then I went into academia, and now not only am I still in academia, but I own a private uh, business doing you know, all the fitness stuff and rehab, as well as I work with a nonprofit organization. So I tell you that so that it kind of gives you a little background uh, helping you to understand where I'm coming from because no one ever teaches us about money. It, we can learn the science behind everything and there are a million great trainers out there, but if you don't have the financial backing to support you, well, you're going to be working for Gold's Gym or something and you know no one really wants to do that unless you own it. So, I mean, Gold's Gym is great, I don't, you know, but uh, I'm just saying everybody wants to have their own way and so today, what I'm going to do, it's a very different approach because police, fire, military are all nonprofit entities, whether you realize that or not, all nonprofit entities. And those of you who are for profit, what I'm going to do today is teach you how to partner with nonprofit and how to find money that you didn't know was out there. And just a quick little survey here for me. How many of you here represent police? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you represent fire? Okay, and military? And how many of you are private for profit? Okay, and how many of you have no idea but you just thought, hey, we're talking about money? Okay, awesome. So I'm from LA, just right down the road in lower Alabama. Um, so it's not that far of a drive coming out here. Um, you know, it's a little different out there. I'm on the Gulf Coast. I'm right there with um, all kinds of military from Biloxi down to Pensacola, Destin, Eglin. So I have a wide variety of interesting people that I work with. Um, I work in adaptive sports. I teach wounded vets to kayak. Um, it's amazing what we can do, you know, putting a butt in a boat, how we can save lives doing that and how it equalizes the playing field because, you know, we can adapt everything to make them, you know, a pretty awesome athlete. So let me go through the boring stuff up front. And what I want to do with this really is very different from some of your other lectures. I want to keep this kind of an open dialogue. Um, just keep in mind, I'm so severely ADD that if you ask me too many crazy questions, it's like squirrels running around the room. I use PowerPoint to remind me of what I was talking about. So if there's something along the way that is really pressing, please just talk and ask and we'll go through it. Because what I want you to do is leave today with information that you can use immediately. There, I just want to you know, help you relax a little bit. There's no scientific backing to anything I'm doing. So you don't have to try to figure all that out and Google words and look up things. So, you know, it's just uh, lay, you know, terminology, but you do need to know and understand a few things, okay? So you need to know the differences in different types of uh, for-profit, non-profit. For-profit organization simply is one who makes money doing what they're doing, okay? So any of our gyms or, any organizations, you know, my private company that, you know, contracts and hires out and does corporate wellness or anything like that, those are all for profit. We make money doing what we're doing. A nonprofit organization, there's so many different types of nonprofits, but usually they're chari charities, associations, anything like that. But they're, the key is they're formed to further cultural, educational, religious, professional, and public service objectives. That's the key right there in order to apply for a nonprofit status. Most non-governmental organizations are nonprofit organizations, and they are granted tax exemptions 
So um, anyone who makes a contribution to a nonprofit organization, they get a tax exempt letter from them so that they can write this off, which is great. Okay, you have, I'm gonna go through real quick just some of the different types of nonprofit because a lot of people had no idea. They just think that there's one type, a 501c3, but no, there's different ones. You have a 509a1. Um, this is typically schools, hospitals, churches, and other charities that use public support, like ties and endowments and gifts like that to help support them. Then you have exempt purpose activity supported charities, 509A2, your zoos, museums, things like those, those are all nonprofit. You have um, supporting organizations. These are not publicly supported themselves, but they are tied to nonprofits that are publicly supported. So universities, you know, everybody thinks that universities make a lot of money. Really, truly, they're nonprofit. And so they don't make money. The money is invested back into the program. So the tuitions, and what's really interesting, a lot of people don't realize, is that the tuitions that are paid by students to go to the university, say, um, I'm a Georgia grad, so I'm in the university system of, of Georgia. And now I'm in Alabama, and don't make fun of me. But um, in, when you have the system like the USG system, University System of Georgia, there's 35 universities. So when um, a student pays tuition, it doesn't go directly to that university. It goes within the system of 35, 37 universities. And so then it gets put in a, a pooled fund and then divided out however they do that. And what's also interesting is that the sports programs are separate. So the money that comes in through you know, the sports and all of that money that they make, they have to contribute a certain portion back into scholarships. So again, they aren't really making money even though, you know, University of Alabama, second, well, actually number one in the nation for the amount of money they spend, $81 million, but um, on their football team. And I don't ever say, I say go dogs, but uh, <laughs> So, you know, when you see the amount of money being spent on these university sporting teams, it's, you know, this is not money that is profit making. It has to go back into the system. Does that make sense? Did I totally lose you? Okay, so now we have public safety charities. These are exclusively, exclusively dedicated to testing for public safety. So do you have any idea what that might be? Obscure stuff. Any of my police or fire, you have any idea? Studies on fitness, I mean, is that? Yeah, some of that's in there. But also, even more obscure, how about your um, fire alarms? Who tests those? How do we know they work? Who created those? Yeah, that sort of stuff. So you have organizations that are dedicated to doing the research and studies on this sort of stuff that promotes safety. So we have private foundations, and that's what I'm gonna talk about a lot today, because I think this is where you're going to be really surprised at these private foundations, because that's where you're going to make friends and partner with. Uh, you have different, a whole slew of private foundations. And my last two slides, um, really and truly, if you don't have the PowerPoints, are they allowed to take pictures of the slides? Okay, no videos, take pictures, because I put loads of links in there for you of where to find money, okay? So it's probably more important than anything I'm gonna tell you today, but pretend that you're interested. So when we look at private foundations, it may be um, a charitable organization, usually funded by one source rather than the public, generates revenue from investments, endowments, funds, things like that, and it focuses on making grants to other charitable organizations. Can you give me an example of a foundation or an organization that has foundations? None? Yeah, they have a foundation. Uh huh. How about Home Depot and Lowe's? I tell you that because Home Depot and Lowe's has huge grants 
that are community-based grants. You don't have to be a grant writer or an academic or anything else. You just have to have a really great idea that's going to help other people. And they have community-based grants that you can build gardens for people. You can help out with schools. You can, you know, anything that Home Depot or Lowe's can give you gift cards to use their stuff out of their stores. The other thing is Home Depot and Lowe's both have Vets for Vets grants. So Veterans Helping Veterans. I've written five of those grants. And what we've done with those is we've done anything from rebuilding and remodeling kitchens in homeless veteran shelters to going around and identifying. I use the Student Veterans Association in the school. And I use them as well as, you know, I helped out with it to identify um, veterans in our community who needed minor repairs on their homes or maybe needed washers and dryers, roof repair, you know, small stuff that we could do. But here's the cool thing is that both Home Depot and Lowe's has an outreach team that will come out and help you build things. How awesome is that? And there are simple grants that the layperson can write. You don't have to be a grant writer. Although it does help to partner with really smart people so that the wording is such that you're guaranteed to get these. The Vets for Vets grants are about $5,000. So let me give you an example of how we are using the Vets for Vets grants. We, with my organization that I work with, we have a need right now that we need a storage shed to put all of our kayaking gear in. Um, because I've run out of room at my house and the carport, I can't fit any more boats under. So what we did is we reached out in the community and we found a very generous person to donate us a permanent space. And he has um, a space that he can't use within his storage unit in the parking lot. He says, hey, do you want this? Yeah. And it's a permanent home. Now we need a shed to do this. Ace Hardware has grants and sponsorships that they will come out and help build this stuff. So now we wrote the grant. We're just waiting on them to come back and say, yes, we love you so much. We're going to give you this money to do it. And they give it to you in the form of gift cards to come buy whatever it is you need. And they connect you with the outreach team. So they'll build us a shed to house all our, our equipment in. How awesome is that? So most of you in here are vets, right? And you love to serve other vets. And so there are things that you can do. How about, um, and let's see, Lowe's has grants up to $25,000. These are grants that you don't, anything under $50,000 typically doesn't require you to go through a university, a grant writer, or things like that. You can do these things. You just really need to talk to other people who have done it so that you get the wording and verbiage correct so that it guarantees that you have a better chance at getting this. And you're always welcome to keep my contact. And you know I can help you with some of the words or just put you in contact with people who are way smarter than I am um, So you know to help you along the way. There are organizations out there that will help you write fitness programs for underprivileged kids. We wrote a grant. Are any of you familiar with the SPARK program with the Boys and Girls Club? Yeah, I wrote that grant. That's now a national program in the Boys and Girls Clubs all over the United States. Look it up. It's a SPARK program for Boys and Girls Clubs. Well, here's where you come in. What we did is it, they needed a health initiative. And we have an epidemic of obesity in our young people like crazy. And one of the things that you know, I think about all the time is that, you know, especially military, being fit to fight, how you know, the statistics, and this is you know, the nerdy side that I work on, reading all the research and statistics, last statistics showed one out of four 17 to 24-year-olds could not pass the basic PFTs or physical fitness requirements to uh, make it through boot camp. 
Okay, so in my opinion, not only do we have an issue with our physical fitness and our young people, and we're seeing a high rate of injuries, I mean, attend any class and they show you that, but I think that poses a homeland security issue for us because if we don't have people fit to fight, they can, can't protect our own country and our borders and whatever it is we need because we know from the speech, you know, our keynote speaker, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So why aren't we going backwards and going to the beginning source of the problem and working within our school system and fixing our physical education in the school? I mean, we've taken all the priority away from any kind of movement, and then how do you expect them to be, you know, in good physical condition to be able to go into the military? It's kind of, you know, counterintuitive. So we have created these kind of initiatives. The only problem is, is that they reach a small population of kids. Mainly these are underprivileged kids who can go to the boys and girls clubs and there's not boys and girls clubs everywhere. They're mainly in inner city areas. So we have all these rural kids who do not get exposure to these kind of programs. These programs not only teach nutrition, but they teach physical fitness and they have accountability. Well, guess who teaches them? Community-based personal trainers. And guess what? You're not doing it for free. You get paid. Why? Because we build that into the grant. Light bulb's going off yet? It's only going to get better, I promise. Okay, so in order to find money, can we close that door behind you, please? Thank you. In order to get money, the first thing you need to do is identify who you are. Define your mission and goals for, funding, for wanting to find and receive money. You, I tell people you have to work backwards. When you find money out there, it's easier to find the money first and then tailor your goals around the money. Because if you have this brilliant idea but no one knows about it, it's hard to match funds with that. So if you can tailor your brilliant idea with these organizations who have the money and want to give it to you, then you know that's a win-win on both sides. And from there, once you have that, um, then you can start expanding and building from there. So you know when you do this, this determines your where, how, and what kinds of grants you may wish to pursue. So you know there are organizations out there that you wouldn't even realize. Budweiser is a fantastic organization that supports veterans all the time. We do fundraising opportunities. I'm going to talk about this in just a second. There are, you know, Budweiser is first on board to take care of a lot of our miscellaneous needs. It costs money. There are other organizations, other large foundations that you do you need to start um, partnering with universities in order to get it? And I'll tell you why in a second. So let me tell you what grants are. Grants, in a nutshell, are free money. OK? You can read all the blah, blah, but really just take note, it's free money. That's what it is. So they come from different, um, different resources. They can come from endowments. Endowments are kind of when people die and they will the money to you. So Make friends, don't burn bridges, you know, and especially nice, rich friends, you know, because they may leave you all that money to keep you going, okay? So you'll see, you know, subsidies, contributions, handouts, all these sort of things, gifts, scholarships, all these Fortune 500 companies, all of them, no exception, have to have a certain amount of money they give away every year in order to have some of the tax exemptions they do. All of them. Do you know how much money goes unpaid every year just because people either one are too lazy to write a little paper essay for it or you know just don't seek out the resources to ask? So much money. Every uh, course has scholarships for kids. You know, all of these, when I first went to college, I mean, I came from a very poor family that it's, you know, when I went in the military, it was because I wanted to go to college and I wanted to have a different life. And I knew that in order for me to be educated, it gave me options for my life. But when you come from, you know, 
backcountry Appalachians and their coal miners, farmers, and steel mill workers, no one's educated. You work. That's what you do. And when I said I wanted to go to college, they laughed at me. And I said, don't laugh at me because later on you're going to need me. And so, and that's what happened. I knew that at an early age, I had to excel at something. So I poured myself into everything, whether it was music, sports, art, whatever I could do, because I knew something would stick. And, you know, by the time I graduated, I had a couple scholarships, but not enough to really support me going to school. But what I did do is I passed seven auditions to play for the U.S. Army Band and they sent me to school. And they sent me to school again. And then the GI Bill sent me to school again. And then Folk Rehab sent me to school again. And then I won a full ride scholarship to finish my doctorate. So I've never paid for any of my education. So, but what I did to get started, because they told me in order to be in the military bands, you have to have a college degree in music. I'm like, oh, I'm screwed. <laughs> you know, what am I going to do? So, you know, when you want something bad enough, you get really resourceful, don't you? I sat down in a library when there were books that we read, and <laughs> I looked and I went through a gigantic book like this on scholarships. I got scholarships for the most obscure things that you could ever imagine. I got $500 for being Irish. I got, you know, um, like $500 for part of my family being, you know, descendants of the Civil War. Obscure stuff. Coors gave me a scholarship, a $1,000 scholarship. We get these paper books. It paid for me two years of college that was enough to, for the Army to say, okay, come on in, we'll let you in. And then they sent me to school in New York City to finish my music degree. Yeah. So you just have to be resourceful and you got to want it. If you want anything bad enough, you'll find a way to get it done, right? So with that being said, let's talk about who you can partner with. Those of you who are for profit in here, you know, it is a really confusing thing that um, how do I get money? Because number one, you can't get grants on your own. There is less than 1% of grants that are actually available for a for-profit. So what you have to do is you need to make friends and you need to do it in such a way that it, it benefits the nonprofit organization you're with. So what they tell you is, well, first off, what who you can partner with is other nonprofits, for profits, but if you're a nonprofit, you can partner with for profits, so working back and forth here. But here's the key is that the nonprofit's mission must be first and foremost, okay? Not yours. It has to be the nonprofit. So let's see. Um, let's say, for example, the Boys and Girls Club, like we were talking about. What is their mission? Do you know, any of you know anything about the Boys and Girls Club? Without knowing their mission statement, you know, verbatim, their goal is really to um, take what would be classified at-risk youth, kids who have the potential to get in trouble and, you know, they're in bad areas and neighborhoods and bad influences, to give them a safe haven to where they can thrive. And they want to do that by providing resources and alternatives to some of the deviant behavior. So keeping that mission in mind, you must figure out how you're going to partner with them, keeping their mission first and foremost. So if you're a fitness professional and you want to partner with the Boys and Girls Club, how are you going to do that? What are you going to do? It's not a trick question. You got to work with the kids, but how are you going to do that in a way that, you know, kids um, don't always want to listen to adults, and there's a disconnect generationally. So how are you going to work with them? What are you going to do? Let's think sports psychology for a second. You know what's really interesting in sports psychology, and knowing 
everything I do about working the human body and creating programs and doing everything else, do you know what sports psychologists have determined the number one reason everything boils down to why a person will not exercise? Even though we know all the benefits of it, do you know what that one reason is? It's how it feels while you're doing it. So let's think about kids. Who wants to exercise if it hurts and it feels like work? Um, no one, really. So, but everybody wants to play. So you need to be creative in the way that you format your programs. So create programs that integrate play and you know, and break down a lot of the barriers that keep people from wanting to participate. So with that in mind, I'm just using the Boys and Girls Club as an example because it's the first thing that popped in my head. Um, let's look at, you know, how can you get paid for that? Well, if you started designing a program and started tracking some of your progress, like most professionals do, you do initial assessments. And for kids, it could simply be BMI. We don't really like BMI, but the only useful, uh, the only use I think for BMI, and you know, I'm sorry if I offend anyone, is for older sedentary people and kids. Outside of that, you know, throw it out the window. But um, so you can start with BMI. It's one of the things we did with the university. I just a non-funded study. I just took my exercise science students out to the housing. Um, projects within our city and we took and measured the BMI of every kid within those um, neighborhoods. Why? Because we get a pretty broad representation, don't we? And so from that we calculated the results and showed, you know, high levels of BMI, sedentary activity. So what, what happened? We got a grant to put playgrounds in every single one of the housing developments. It was a non-funded, simple research study. Did we need money to take the students out during class to go do height and weight on these kids? No, we didn't. Can you do this? Can you support what you're doing and then show proof that it works? And then you have the organization that's a nonprofit write a grant to support you to continue that program? Shake your head. You can. OK, so here's a great little link for you. How do I do this? I'm, I can't do it here. I have to go up here, don't I? This is a great resource for you. Hopefully, it comes up. OK, or not. Um, it's not coming up. There's no internet connection in here. It's OK. Copy that link. Okay, this link gives you loads and loads of resources for grants, okay, and uh, for funding. This gives you all these different foundations, I mean, hundreds of foundations that you can partner with. So depending on what your theme or goal is, if it's clinical, if it's recreation-based, if it's youth, if it's military, you can find foundations. This right here is a great link for it, OK? So I'll let you get that. You good? OK. All right, so let's talk about fundraising because not only as a for-profit with my company, I partnered with all of these um, city municipalities, which are nonprofit, right, to be able to do collaborative programming. Now, I'm talking about this. It was kind of funny. When I was um, asked to do this speech, I was thinking, what in the world am I going to talk about? And then I realized I've been doing this for so many years that it's just kind of second nature that you know, in the changing times, and I had businesses when the economy crashed in 2007. I lost all my corporate businesses. I, GE Capital closed down the entire division. Nortel psh, left the United States. You know, I lost every um, car dealership I had. You know, I had seven or nine of them at that time it, within a matter of three months. So how am I going to eat <laughs> and, you know, not lose my house and everything else in a time like that. You have to get really creative. 
And so that's when I just started changing the way I did things. I started partnering up and making you know, more uh, community-based group fitness programs. I gave some of my service away to people who really needed it but couldn't afford it. And I did donations for it. And then once a month, we took all those donations and put them into a local organization within our community and gave back. We started getting recognition for that. When you get recognition for being good stewards of your community, what do you think happens? Yes, they are. And they're willing to sponsor and create scholarships for people to come to your program. So guess what? Did I lose any money? No, because those scholarships paid for an individual to participate in my program. So it meant that it cost this much based on how much I got to pay the trainer, how much it costs to um, you know, create the, the program itself. So you got to get creative. You got to think outside of the box. So what we did, this, all of this stuff happened within the last year. I started an organization down you know, where I'm at now. I told you, um, serving wounded vets in adaptive sports. Well, you know, we're part of a national organization that supports us with our first fleet of boats, about $5,000. We um, get about five boats, PFDs, and paddles. Well, you know, when you start reaching out to one or two, they tell their friends, and you quickly run out of equipment. So they said, in order to support ourselves, we need to do fundraising. Like, I've never really done fundraising on my own. Um, I've worked with other people and have done it. But when you need money, you learn and you figure out how to do things quickly, right? Again, you become very resourceful or you perish. And so I found organizations within our community. One was called Fired Up Inc. And what they are, they're just business owners, entrepreneurs who started this. Uh, they do barbecue. And what they did is they started it for a friend of theirs who lost their husband, who was a police officer in the line of duty. And they wanted to help the family somehow and support the kids for the future. So all of these guys got together and got these smokers out and started smoking barbecue ribs. And they were so good that other people asked them. And they raised a lot of money for the family and the kids to keep them going for a while. And then it just rolled into something that they didn't even know um, was going to become so big. Well, within a couple months of starting the organization where I'm at, we called them up and they kind of vet you know, who they want to work with because I, they have full-time jobs. They can only do you know, this once in a while. So they picked us and what we did is we sold the raw meat the racks of ribs that fed like four to five people. And I mean, I'm in the Redneck Riviera. There is no one that doesn't like barbecue, okay? I plan my kayaking trips around the best barbecue. So if I can't find a barbecue shack when I'm done, barbecue and beer, we're probably not doing that river. So, you know, <laughs> so I mean, I knew the barbecue was going to be a big hit, but I didn't realize that. $5,500 worth of barbecue is what we were going to do in one month um, because I didn't know how to do fundraising. And so, you know, kind of procrastination and pulling a lot of monkeys out, um, trying to figure out what to do. In one month, we sold that much, enough to where we can donate. We donated um, 10 racks of ribs to the veterans' home so that they could enjoy it for free. And we brought it up to them as well. But $5,500 we raised off of barbecue ribs. Because when that smoker starts going, and you know we had it in a great place, man, it was like Pepe Le Pew's feet floating along. And you know people smelled that. They were pulling in left and right. Hey, what, you got any more ribs left? Well, we have a couple left, because we bought extra knowing that would happen. So $5,500 we raised. That out fitted six more vets. So we just did another two weeks ago, find your local breweries. What we did is we partnered with Fairhope Brewery and we did pints for paddles. So, I mean, come on, vets and beer. 
I know it's not the healthiest thing, but it does go together. And we raised $2,500 in one day doing cornhole tournaments, silent auction, and selling beer. So the brewery donated a dollar for every beer that we sold. Okay, $2,500 goes to buy more adaptive equipment. So we have ongoing, you have to have some ongoing residual um, revenue as well. So we partnered obscure things. I'm telling you, you have to be creative. I'm showing you this to start thinking outside the box. So we partnered with Bell Rose Tattoos so that every single person who comes in to get a tattoo who mentions our organization's name, 90% of that tattoo is donated to us. 90%. That's crazy. And so there's a little um, flyer up at their front desk when people come in, even if they don't know about us, they can read about it and it's their choice. They say, hey, I'd like to, you know, um, donate to this organization. It's an ongoing thing. So, and then um, you always have Facebook. Facebook has a place on there that you can do a donation page and a fundraising page and it's free. In one month of putting up our fundraising page, we had $1,500 in donations online from people who we didn't even know from all over the United States. So you can do this. Police and fire. You have auxiliaries. You know the auxiliaries end up buying a lot of things that you need because you can't get it through the city municipalities, fire department. So here's what I want to tell you about, um, I'm, let me finish the fundraiser part and I'm going to start giving you some um, information that you can use right now. So when you are thinking and considering a fundraiser, now for profits, what you do is you partner with nonprofits. And this is a way for you not only to get publicity, but for you to get your foot in the door to start um, initiating programs, providing you know, your um, gear to them. And I'm going to start, I'll go in a little more detail after I give you the overview of it. So what does it involve? You need to figure out what you want. If it's food, beverages, supplies, whatever it is you're doing, um, look at donations from your local grocery stores. Sam's Club donated to us. Target donated a gift card to us. Bought all our paper supplies, everything. Um, Publix, I mean, ribs, they're only ribs. But what do you like with ribs? Barbecue beans and coleslaw. I mean, you have to put those together, right? So Publix donated all of that to us, um, enough to feed everyone. And then guess what? Budweiser. We love Budweiser because they brought a beer truck out and said, here, whatever you sell, it meters the number of beers. So at the end of the day, whatever um, the number of beers, and they actually donated the beer for this, they said, we'll just give you a dollar for every beer, and it was donated for free at the barbecue. They just had the beer truck out there. Now, here's what else they do for us. All our signs that we need, the banners, they make them. Nonprofits, police officers, fire departments, when you're doing these boot drives and everything, you need to go talk to organizations like this because they will make them for free. They did a gigantic banner that probably was, you know, from the door to me, huge banner that we put at both sides of the main roads. Oh, and, uh, and they did that for free. So ask them and ask these organizations to do that. Don't be afraid to ask. What are they going to do? Say no? You didn't have it before, so what have you lost? Nothing. Okay. So beverages as uh, what I talked about. You can also, I mean, Publix gave us um, gallons of iced tea, things like that, supplies, all of those gift cards help. Your location is so critical to your fundraising. It needs to be in a high traffic area where people can see you and find you. We were very purposeful in the barbecue because we made sure that people could circle right in and right out, and we had them wrapped and rolled. So they came in, picked it up, and left. That was it. So when they prepaid online, because we had it set up that way, they just we had their name, they gave us their name, here's their ribs, see you later. And then that's when people were out doing garage sales and smelled the barbecue and came in and asked, yep, here's the rib, 30 bucks. There it is, and left. So because we were so centrally located, people could find us. We even had people from the fire department right behind us going, we recognize that smell. You got any more? <laughs> 
So it's, that's really important. Now, what's more important? Well, and also you must check in with your local authorities because there are different ordinances that they have, right, police department? You know, where you can put the signs, what you can do, how close to the road. So make sure you do things right and ask up front. And then volunteers. Volunteers are critical to everything you do. Whether you're your own company, you don't have enough employees to go out there and do your um, warm-ups for these 5Ks or to set up and hand out information on your organization. So find volunteers, be it Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, your local churches, all of these places have to have um, volunteer hours. What we do is there's a veterans court system and we go and get the vets who are in the court system to work with our veterans organization because they have to have community hours in. And what we do is we partner them with high functioning vets who have integrated themselves well into the community so that they could be good role models to them. And we have these vets out here with us doing the volunteer work. So not only do they see what we're doing for a good purpose and hopefully inspire them to do good things, but they're getting community hours for their veterans court. So use your resources. Um, time of the year is really important. So make sure that you match your fundraiser with the time of the year. I mean, we don't really have winter. So, I mean, this is kind of our January, December timeframe, this weather out here. Um, so it's a little chilly to me. But we don't really have winter, so we can do things all year round. But there are times of the year that people like things better, right? So make sure that you plan for that. And make sure that you are planning for your outdoor events, that you have proper shelter and all these sorts. These are all miscellaneous things that you just need to know, okay? So you can pull this stuff up and look at it and always have a plan B, okay? So um, you've got a lot of promotion that you can do. Here's the thing that you need to know. Both for profit, if you're doing something for free for your community, your radio, TV, newspaper, um, online, they all have spots for public service announcements and they will do interviews with you. I've been on the radio so many times talking about our organization and like 10 minute long interviews. We had the TV station out the um, big local TV news station out filming us for two hours to run a 10 minute segment. This, I, my phone was ringing off the hook with vets who wanted to participate in our program after that. When I had my company and we were doing a community sponsored event that we were coming out and um, donating our time to work with a local charity and do this stuff for them, we were on TV with them getting the highlight and spotlight that you cannot afford to pay for. And guess what? I had so many new members in our small little gyms with the following months. Why? Because they saw that we were part of our community, helping our community. And did it um, turn into revenue for us? Yeah. $10,000 in new clients within one year. So if you want to run the numbers, it's really, you know, look at that. And it's important for you to get out and do a lot of public speaking. What we do is very personal and, you know, people want to know who you are and what you're doing. So it's really important that they put a face because they need to vet you. There are a lot of people, especially in veteran service organizations, we took some bad rap from a large organization getting some bad publicity. So now for those of us who are smaller entities, a lot of people are wondering where their money is going and how it's being used and they're more focused on keeping it in their community. So it's really important that you have those key words when you're out there public speaking because for us, one of the first things I say is 90% of everything we raise stays right here in our organization. Only 10% goes to national. And complete transparency right there. They say thank you. These people who help you and donate to you, make sure that you follow up, say thank you to them, and tell them how much money you raised at this fundraiser. Tell them where the money is going, what you did. Um, let them know because these are the same people who we just found out, this is a second fundraiser we did. We found out this person came to the last one, had no idea who we were, came again, and guess what they started doing? Direct deposit 
into our national organization for our specific chapter every single month. Every month they donate to us now because they believe in what we're doing. And so let's look. I have very little time, so I'm going to put this up, take a picture of it because these are resources for you. What I want to tell you is with universities, if you are not affiliated with a university, you need to start making friends, okay? So I was talking to some of my buddies who are out here, um, exhibitors, and just looking at different ways to collaborate as a for-profit. So um, Andy, is it okay if I use y'all as an example? Okay, so get a picture of this. I'm gonna put the next one up for you. Um, say for example, you have a really awesome product and you know, say you are, you know, there are other people in the industry who have a similar product to you that's really pretty awesome. So how do you get people to use your stuff and not their stuff? Um, what you do is number one, everybody wants research, right? How many sessions have you been in and just all this research, right? It's great, but you know, information input is too much sometimes. Everybody wants research. They want to know how it works. So you go to your local university and you say, hey, you know, in the human performance department or whatever, um, we have a policy in research, R1 institutions. You need to know that because when you look for research, you need to check your universities and see if they're a liberal arts university or if they are an R1 research institution. If they're a research institution, we have policies to where we call it uh, publish or perish. We don't get to keep tenure. We have to publish a certain amount um, in order to go up for review to keep our tenure. So keep in mind, if you ask for us to do research and it aligns with our specialization or something we're interested in, and we say, huh, well, that's pretty interesting, the next thing we have to do is go look for grant. We, not you, we go look for grants and say, and look for the money first and see what's out there to try to match it with kind of you know what you're doing, what you want to do. So we try to pair your mission with the money. Now keep in mind, it may not be the results that you want because in order to be unbiased, we need to be unbiased researchers and scientists. So we're looking at the full picture of how this works and whether or not it's effective. So you need to know that you're rolling the dice that the, the results may not be what you want. So, you know, but here's the thing. If it is, and it proves the effectiveness of what you're doing, guess who's a rock star, and guess what else? The grant pays for us to buy your equipment to do the research. Okay, now who's winning in this? And guess what? If we publish this research and say using this equipment does this, and you read that in the Journal of you know, Strength and Conditioning with the NSCA, um, guess what you're buying? Now do you see why this is important for you to partner? Was this useful information? Okay, nod so I hear something. Okay.